So thank you everyone for coming to the Graphs and Matroids seminar. Today our very own Peter Nelson from Waterloo is going to be telling us about uh, formalizing matroids. <clears throat> Thanks, Rose. Uh, yeah, as the, as the title suggests, this isn't really a research talk in the usual sense I'd give. Uh, instead, it's a talk about something which I've been very into recently uh, that I would maybe call research adjacent. Uh, it's <clears throat> proof formalization, which is uh, roughly the process of writing down proofs in such a way that they're not intended for a human to read and check, but instead for a computer to read and check. Uh, the project I'll be talking about uh, is joint work with Ed Lee and Mathieu Gipake. Uh, okay, so I, I, there are actually a few different motivations that you could talk about to, um, to start thinking about writing proofs that can be checked by computers. Uh, the one that resonates the most with me is the only one I'll talk about. Uh, and that's to do with trusting the correctness of proofs. Now, I am talking about trusting the correctness of things. I want to make it very clear. I, I'm not really talking about trusting against any form of dishonesty, bad behavior, bad faith. I'm talking about trusting against uh, normal human fallibility. Um, so I don't secretly believe that any famous theorems in my area are actually wrong or mistrust any of any of the people in this talk. But um, when I talk about trust, I just mean uh, trying to be as sure that we can that something is correct. So the question is, if you show me a proof, if you claim to approve the theorem and you've got a hundred page proof, uh, what, who do I need to trust to believe that? Uh, now, the first answer is I could just trust you. Um, of course, we do this in many cases when someone claims they've proved something, even if the peer review hasn't happened, we will often just trust the person because of their reputation or, um, or something like that. <clears throat> uh, another option is that you can read the proof yourself. So you can ask them for the proof and you read the, the proof and you check all the details yourself. And you could argue that you're gonna be more confident when you've done that. So you're trusting yourself and the normal peer review process is an extension of this. So we, we trust other experts to have read things. And if a few people have read something independently and they all believe it, then it, it's more likely that it's true. Uh, I think this is a pretty, a pretty good system. As I said, I'm not, I don't have major doubts about any theorems that are on my radar. Um, but of course, there are some natural reasons one might be uncomfortable about this. Um, no one likes reading 100 pages of technical details, and it's not the reason we do math to check someone else's case analysis. Uh, referees don't get paid. Um, I'm not saying they should, but it's just it, it affects the incentives involved, and people can be sloppy, and I'm certainly including myself uh, in saying that. Uh, so I think that it would be nice if we could have something better, and what I'm talking about is kind of um, in that direction. Uh, the thing that I'm not really talking about, but I'll just mention for the sake of clarity, uh, is proofs that use computations. So if your 100 page proof involved a very tedious case analysis where you had to check that no matroid on up to seven elements was a counter example, then uh, one, one way you could do that is instead of doing it all yourself, just feed it into Sage and get Sage to check that all, there's no small counter examples to your theorem. And that might take 50 pages off the proof, but it still involves some level of trust. Um, I won't mention any further questions about whether we can trust programming languages, CPUs, operating systems, et cetera. Um, even if we assume that we're trusting them completely, you're still trusting someone to write code correctly or trusting yourself to check that code is correctly written. And code being correct is very subtle, as you know, if you've ever tried to prove an algorithm is correct. It's, there are subtleties and it's not hard to imagine people making mistakes. Uh, so. What I'm, I'm talking about and I'm being, I've been very interested in recently is the use of proof assistance, which is uh, a way to potentially solve this problem. Uh, so I'll try to be a bit clearer about what I mean here. <clears throat> to prove a theorem in a way that can be understood by a proof assistant or to use a proof assistant means to write the proof completely differently from how you'd normally write a proof. So you don't make a PDF document with English words string together in, in ways that make mathematical sense that it's intended for a person to read. Instead, you write your proof completely in, in what's essentially a programming language. So you, you take a formally specified language, the one you can see here and the one I'll be talking about is called Lean, uh, and you write your proof in a way that uh, can be essentially parsed line by line and checked for correctness by uh, the proof checking software by, um, by this proof assistant. So here you can see this is a proof of something and you can probably guess what this is a proof of by reading the theorem statement up the top. 
This says that in, if you have a matroid, then the dual of the relaxation of a set is the same as the relaxation of the complement of that set in the dual matroid, right? Um, now, if you haven't worked with proof assistance before, I'd be very surprised if you could make sense of what's below, but what's below there is actually a proof of this that can be checked line by line. If you have all the appropriate lemmas I'm referring to in the same file somewhere, and you feed this into the lean proof assistant, then it will show you goals accomplished, which means that it is checking every line of the proof and it all checks out logically. So every line, I mean, to put it somewhat simplistically, every line follows from the previous one by axioms. Okay, who are we trusting now? Well, if you give me a long proof that's written in this way and I run it through a proof assistant and it tells me it's correct, I don't have to trust you or myself. Right, you're giving me code, but all I'm trusting is that the proof checker is actually checking things correctly so that what it's doing is mathematically sound. So of course I'm trusting whoever wrote that. Uh, proof checkers are not terribly huge pieces of software. They're deliberately kept to be as kind of as small as possible. Uh, they're clearly written by programming experts and uh, I wouldn't be able to understand one if I read it myself. But the advantage is that if there's a thousand proofs presented in this way, you still only need the one proof checker. So the amount of trust you need, it doesn't grow with the number of theorems you want to believe. Um, you just need the one proof checker that uh, checks them all. And another advantage I think um, of this approach is where plausibly mistakes would happen. Uh, so I think that the, the plausible scenario for mistakes slipping through the peer review process is the following or something like it. Uh, I really want to prove a theorem uh, I'm thinking wishfully, I make a subtle oversight, uh, and I've, I've obviously got a vested interest in making oversights somehow. I, I will try to not do, the, do that, but it's always possible. And then the referee probably wants the theorem to be true and isn't getting paid and is reading something at 11 at night and makes the same oversight. I mean, that, that's how mistakes would happen. Uh, I don't think they do tend to happen that much, but that's how they would happen. That's not gonna happen with a proof assistant. The, the person who wrote the proof assistant software, they do not have a vested interest in your particular theorem being true. The proof assistant doesn't know at all what your little area of mathematics is. So you'd have to have some strange logical bug that somehow coincides exactly with what I needed to make a false theorem true. I think even if you say that's not impossible, I would say it's vastly less plausible than the kind of mistakes that, that, that uh, I would actually be worried about. So I think proof assistants are, a really good uh, alternative in terms of trusting things to uh, the system we have now. Um, I think it would be asking a lot to, to ask everyone to just suddenly write their proofs this way. It's not easy to use proof assistance. It's a quite steep learning curve. Um, but I would like to see this making its way into the culture in one way or another. And I don't have strong views about exactly how that should happen, but I think it would be an improvement on our current system. Uh, one thing I didn't, I didn't mention is that uh, you can further reduce how much you're trusting an individual because languages that proof assistants are reading, those are the, the specification of them is public. So if you want, if you don't believe one thing that checks a proof written in lean, then you can just write your own one. And this has actually happened. There are three different um, separate pieces of software that check correctness of lean proofs. And you can pick which one of them you want to trust. You can run tests to see if they disagree with each other ever. So you can uh, even further how much you're confident in, in mathematical truth. Uh, so I said, this is hard. Um, it takes a lot of learning to, to get to use one of these things, uh, but it's really not impossible. Um, I've, I've kind of <clears throat> gone from zero to something which I'm happy with in a few months uh, and uh, much more <clears throat> exciting theorems exist that have been proved in lean, uh, sorry, in, in proof assistance. Uh, so the most famous example is uh, Kepler's conjecture. This is the conjecture that was proved by Thomas Hales in 1998, um, that you cannot pack spheres in three-dimensional space any more efficiently than a kind of standard green grocer piling up oranges hexagonal lattice. Um, this proof was presented in 1998 and it was incredibly complicated. It involved gigabytes of computational data to verify uh, nonlinear inequalities. Um, and uh, <clears throat> an AMS journal 
published this, but with the proviso that the referees could only be 99% sure it was correct because they, they couldn't vouch with certainty for the correctness of the entire content of this proof. It's, that's not a great state of affairs, but uh, what, what Hales did was incredible. He took upon the challenge of uh, actually formalizing this and with 21 co-authors in the end did this. And uh, as of 2014, there is a formal proof of Kepler's conjecture, which uses a combination of the Isabel and Hole light uh, proof assistance. Uh, so this is, in my opinion, because of this, it's, this is one of the most trustworthy theorems in mathematics where in 1998, it was something that seemed, um, I mean, everyone believed it, but it was something where the, uh, the question of its truth was less certain than of course, what we all wanted. Um, closer to home for us maybe is the four color theorem. This was formalized by uh, Gontier in 2008. I was quite surprised to learn um, in just in the last few years that there existed a proof of the four color theorem that had been formalized um, because ever since I was an undergrad inter interested in graph theory, the four color theorem always had this slight whiff of controversy to it because of the circumstances of, of its proof in the 70s. Um, and I didn't realize that, um, I mean, again, as far as I'm concerned, the existence of a formalized proof means I can be more confident in the truth of the four color theorem than in say a hundred page proof that I've written myself, because I think there's a, um, a, high, a high bar of um, confidence that can be set by the existence of a formalized proof. Uh, so more specifically, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about um, work that was done in the, the lean <clears throat> programming language. This is a relatively recent proof assistant and many of its design choices have been made with um, uh, perceived problems in the design of other proof assistants in the past. Uh, so it's uh, it, it being recent means it has lots of nice features that people wish other proof assistants had. Um, it was developed by Demura in Microsoft Research uh, in 2013. Uh, Lean 3, which is the code I'll be showing you, was released about four years ago. Uh, and then Lean 4, which is just really hot off the presses and it's not the widely used one yet, uh, was just released this year. Um, one of the huge advantages of, of Lean uh, that I haven't used other proof assistants, but to my knowledge, this is the case that there is an immense math library of, of theorems uh, for Lean 3 um, called MathLib. Uh, it's got about half a million lines of code and 50,000 theorems. <clears throat> theorem is uh, used very broadly. So for instance, A union B equals B union A would count as a theorem, but there's still 50,000 of them. Um, and so Lean has really been uh, embraced by mathematicians uh, in a huge way. Uh, you might ask who else would it be embracing a proof assistant? Uh, the answer is that people that are interested in verifying things about programming languages formally, computer scientists, they use proof assistants. And since proof assistants are pretty computery, uh, they've kind of uh, been using them for years and years and, and mathematicians have been slower to move towards them. But Lean is really, uh, if you're a mathematician, it's, I, I would say it's one of the best choices. What's been done in Lean? Um, my favorite result that's been formalized is the cap set problem. This is a, a beautiful theorem that was proved by uh, Ellenberg and Heisweit in 2016, which says, uh, that if you have a subset of n-dimensional affine space over the three element field that doesn't contain an affine line, then its size is exponentially smaller than uh, the, the size of the space. Um, if you're familiar with the card game set, this is saying that in an n-dimensional generalization of the card game set, uh, the largest set of cards that you can have that does not contain a set in the sense of the game uh, is exponentially smaller than the number of cards in total. Uh, so this was open for a long time, uh, proved in 2016, and then formalized three years later in Lean with just about 2,000 lines of code, which is uh, not very much. And a lot, a lot of that 2,000 lines of code was kind of standard library building rather than stuff that's specific to that proof. Um, something which, as a combinatorialist, it's, it's less crucial for me, but it would be um, remiss not to mention, uh, perfectoid spaces, uh, the, <clears throat> these very... Uh, very deep and technical algebraic object defined by the, the field medalist Peter Schultz. And uh, they are a definition that's built on towers of other definitions. So you need topological spaces, schemes, varieties, sheaves, etc., to get to the definition of a perfectoid space. Uh, they were formalized um, 
in 2019 as well with around 10,000 lines of code just for the definition. Uh, and this is really seen as a proof of concept that this language is actually up to handling higher mathematics. Um, some of what's done for the perfectoid spaces would have been very hard to do with other proof assistants. Um, now you might say 10,000 lines is still a lot for a definition. Uh, when you use formalizers, you will uh, gain a healthy respect for definitions that you don't have necessarily as a mathematician. Um, definitions are somehow very subtle and very important at the same time. Um, okay, so the project I'm talking about is, uh, we call it Lean Matroids. Um, so this is myself and Ed Lee and Mathieu Gibake. Um, we've been working on it for a, a few months. <clears throat> uh, it's around 10,000 lines of code. Uh, it contains a lot of the basic kind of bread and butter of Matroids. So a API, um, this is a programming term, which essentially means a library. So it's like a library of lemmas, definitions, and theorems. Um, this API has a lot of basic lemmas about all the things you'd want in Matroid theory. So uh, rank, rank functions, independence, circuits, bases, closure, flats, duality, and all the, the simple things you'd need that relate them. So that's, that's kind of um, all there or a good amount of it is there. Uh, we've got a number of different constructions, uh, uniform Matroids, truncation, relaxation, partition Matroids, direct sums. Uh, we've got the weak order and, and quotients. Now, these are things that you don't see that much in, um, in contemporary matroid theory research, um, but they actually are quite convenient when you're formalizing. Um, the weak order, the two matroids are related by the weak order. That just means that the rank function of one is bounded above by the rank function of the other when they're on the same ground set. Um, quotients is a sort of refinement of that, which amounts to taking extensions and contractions, another way of saying a matroid is a quotient of another is to say that everything that's a flat in the first matroid is also a flat in the second matroid. Um, uh, matroid intersection is one of the, the two larger results that we've formalized. Um, I'll be showing you that um, in a little bit. And then matroid union, we've kind of partially done. It's not, it's not completely finished, but um, some statement which you could argue has the same content as matroid union theorem um, is formalized. Um, miners, they deserve their own bullet point because miners are a real can of worms. I'll talk about why in a little bit, but it was very, very hard to define miners in a, a way that was working well. Um, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure we've done it. We've done it perfectly, but uh, we've got a kind of definition that can be used. Uh, simplicity in parallel classes, ironically, those are not that simple to formalize for various reasons, uh, but those are done. And Kung's theorem is a, um, a beautiful <clears throat> lemma that bounds above the number of points in a matroid, excluding a certain uniform minor. Um, and uh, we've formalized that. Uh, <clears throat> so some work has been done on formalizing matroids in the past. Um, Brian, Brian Chen did some <clears throat> Matroid stuff in, in Lean uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Kynholz did some stuff in Isabel similarly recently. Um, and then there are things which are more tangentially related to Matroids that have been done in the Mizar and Koch proof assistance um, <clears throat> further into the past. Uh, as far as I know, Lean Matroids is the biggest Matroid library um, that's, been, <clears throat> that's been done in formalization. Uh, okay, so that's all I have by, by way of slides. So part of the point of this talk is, uh, is propaganda. I think that uh, I'm going to be slightly complaining and saying that I found some things difficult, but by and large, I found this to be a ton of fun, like from beginning to end. And um, I think that if what I'm going to show you appeals to you at all, then I'd be interested to, to chat because I think that formalization is something that is, is worth our attention, at least. Um, and I think it really appeals to a certain type of mathematical personality. And if what I'm about to do looks like it would be fun, then it probably would be. So um, in particular, if you're interested in both matroids and formalization, I'd be very happy to, to chat. Um, and if you're just interested in, in formalization, then I can point you towards a number of really good resources for, uh, for learning this stuff. So what I wanna show you is what it actually feels and looks like to use a formalizer. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and start actually typing some stuff. Um. <clears throat> okay, so I kind of said that what a formalizer does, I'm going to hide the images of people. Um, 
what I say, what I said a formalizer does is it will take a proof and it will check it and tell you if it's correct. Uh, that's a little bit of a simplification. Uh, it, it does something that's sort of more useful than that. Uh, what formalizers do is they, uh, they will check proofs as you type them. So they'll kind of, if you type a line and it's wrong, then it will tell you it's wrong. Um, and you can kind of build proofs in a very organic feeling way because of that. So what you can see here, I assume you can see it. Is this big enough to read? Uh, I can see it. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, VS Code, which is a Microsoft based text editor that plays very nicely with Lean thanks to an extension. Uh, when, you're doing, when you're doing stuff in Lean, you are always looking at, well, at least I am, always looking at two windows. On the left, you're typing your program or typing your proof. And on the right, you're going to see the mathematics as it, as it comes. And what's on the right looks more a lot more familiar to a mathematician than what's on the left. But you'll see kind of as I'm typing it how both are happening at once. Um, so I apologize if this goes disastrously wrong. Hopefully, this is all going to work. Uh, so I'm going to give it start with the definition. So what I'll do will be um, not just not rocket science, but very silly, as you'll see. But what I'm, what I'm doing, I just want to show you the sort of beginning of how this, this kind of stuff works. Um, so I'm going to define a property of natural numbers called being even. I made a mistake. Right, that looks right. So hopefully what, what's there is not so hard to read, even if you haven't seen lean code before. Um, this is a definition, so I type def. It's called is even. Uh, it's a definition that applies to an element n of the set of natural numbers. Natural numbers include zero here. Um, it is saying that a natural number is even if there exists another natural number m, so that n is twice m. Okay, so one thing you'll notice here, um, which probably appeals to any mathematicians among you uh, is that um, there's two symbols that you don't normally see if you look at a program. One is the blackboard bold n. I type backslash nat for that and now I get something that actually looks like the set of natural numbers rather than a three character thing. So this looks more mathematical and perhaps even more importantly I've got this backwards e symbol uh, rather than having to type exists. You can type exists. Some people like ASCII and they actually prefer to, to type everything with simpler symbols but um, I'd say most mathematicians probably like uh, Unicode and Lean sort of sort of culturally supports Unicode as well as technically. So all the, the library results and so on will be stated with nice Unicode mathy looking symbols. All right, so here's a definition of evenness and I'll, I'll prove a, a very silly lemma about this. This lemma says that if you have an even number and you add six, then it's still even. All right, uh, probably uncontroversial. Uh, now, what's important here is what's happening over on the right. So what you can see here is called the tactic state. And the tactic state will contain one or more, just in this case, just one goal, and a set of variables and uh, hypotheses about those variables. At the moment, it's very simple. I've got my in my tactic state, I have uh, a, a natural number n, and I want to prove an implication. I want to prove that if n is even, then n plus 6 is even. All right, so I'm really working at a very um, low level, of course, so I actually want to unfold the definition of is even here to prove something. And to do that, over on the left, I type unfold is even. And what that will do, so you can see after and before, it will just unfold the definition of is even in both the places it occurs here. So now I need to prove that there exists an m such that n is twice m implies there exists an m such that n plus six is twice m. Of course, those are different m's. Um, and so what this line I type does, it transforms the goal into something that is the same, but more convenient to work with. Okay, so thinking back to teaching undergraduate, um, undergraduate logic, how do you prove an implication? Well, you want to assume the premise and then derive the conclusion. The way that I add my premise to my set of assumptions is with this tactic called intro. Intro H just takes this 
first part of the implication and then adds it up here as one of my assumptions. All right. Again, basic logic. I, I now have an assumption that tells me that something exists. So of course I want to pull that out. I want to actually produce the thing that is claimed to exist by that assumption so I can work with it. And I need another magic word here. So my my focus, or what, what I'm saying here is that you could sort of you should always be focusing on what's on the right here. That's where the math is. On the left, I'm typing magic words. And if you start to use this, you'll learn them. But on the right is where, where sanity lies. Uh, so what I'm going to type is something that will allow me to pull, um, pull this M that was half N out and work with it. So I'm going to type obtain M H M E H. Right, so now, after I've done that, I have two natural numbers in my context, n and m, and I have a hypothesis that n is twice m. All right, so now this is sort of bringing me closer to, to proving something. I want to prove an existence statement. How do I prove an existence statement? I have to produce something. So I'm going to type use, and I need to produce an even uh, a number when you double it that when you double it gives n plus six. So m plus three should do the trick. And now I've got a goal, which is just some arithmetic, right? n plus six is twice n plus uh, m plus three. Now I can actually, if I want, I can sort of do what are called rewrites to simplify this. So if I rewrite uh, mol add, that will expand those brackets. And I can kind of go from there and do what you'd expect. But of course, anyone looks at this, it's like, why are you typing several lines to do this? This, this is trivial. The fact that this is trivial is well reflected um, when you're actually writing proofs in Lean. I can just type one magic word, Linarith, and it will solve this. Linarith means try to derive the goal using linear combinations of equalities and linear inequalities that appear in the hypotheses. All right, so Linarith, this is not you know, a proof in the sense that it's using axioms, but at the kind of lower level of the language, Linarith could be unfolded to produce some ugly looking proof term. But of course, we don't want to ever think about that doing mathematics. So Linarith is just going to handle this for us. And this is a rigorous proof. This is, um... So you can see there's a combination between doing things manually and automation. Um, this proof is way longer than it needs to be. It certainly doesn't need to be five lines, um, but I just wanted to show you the individual steps. Um, and so this is kind of what's going on that you have, you have this tactic state and you have hypotheses and goals, you transform them and you end up getting goals accomplished, which means that your proof is done. Okay, so we'll do another definition. Hmm. I'm gonna define what it means to be prime. I'll give a very, um, very undergraduate kind of definition. I'm going to say a number is prime if there does not exist A and B such that A is bigger than one and B is bigger than one and A times B is equal to N uh, A times B is equal to P. All right, so probably this is not the, the way that a, a proper mathematician would define primality, but it, it, it clearly does the trick here. Um, the one thing that might seem weird here is that I wrote one less than a rather than a bigger than one. Um, this is because uh, it's part of the, the standard convention when you're, you're writing code in, in Lean to never use inequality symbols that decrease. So inequality symbols less than subset of, all those symbols should go from smaller to bigger. The reason is because if you don't do that, you need twice as many or four times as many versions of all your lemmas. And it's not too much to get used to, to just write all your inequalities in that direction. And that's what I'm doing here. It's, it's second nature at this point. It would look weird to write a bigger than one in this context, even though it's what you'd write normally. Okay, there's a definition of primality. And so we proved a silly theorem. So I'll, I'll state a more serious theorem. <clears throat> now, here I stated a theorem as an implication n is even implies n plus six is even. Uh, instead of that, I could have put n is even up as kind of a hypothesis of the theorem. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say this is a theorem about natural numbers n that are even. So I've got n as a natural number, a hypothesis that n is even, and also as a hypothesis 
that n is strictly greater than two. And the content of this theorem is going to be that there exist natural numbers p and q, so that p is prime and q is prime and p plus q is equal to, uh, is equal to n. All right, so this is clearly a more substantial theorem. This is actually obviously the Goldbach conjecture. And so I'm not going to prove this. Um, but it's something I can state easily enough. And I'm going to do something to prove it, which is really just saying, it's really just cheating, but it can be quite useful. I'll be, I'll be Canadian and I'll say sorry instead of proving it. What that means is pretend this is true. I'll prove it later. So when you have a, a, a big proof and you've got lots of subclaims and so on, you don't necessarily want to prove them all. You want to proceed assuming this is true. And being able to just type sorry and continue is a huge quality of life improvement. No one's going to mistake the sorry for an actual proof. Even though I get goals accomplished when I type sorry, I'm going to get this warning that this declaration uses sorry. So no one's going to think I've, I've actually proved something like this. Uh, uh, Peter, so there's a in question in chat. Uh, yeah. uh, Relinda asks, you don't have to tell that P and Q are integers? That's a good question. Um, lean is smart. And the reason I don't have to is because is prime applies to integers. And lean will infer that I mean natural numbers P and Q. I can, I can do that <clears throat> explicitly. It won't change anything. But because I, I called is prime on P, um, it will uh, just know that I'm talking about natural numbers. It's one of the many nice things about this language. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to do something. Again, I have to keep saying this because uh, this is extremely silly. But I'm going to prove that there's, there's infinitely many primes. And I'm going to do that using the Goldbach conjecture. Um, again, I'm going to make a low budget state version of the statement. I'm going to sh show that whenever you have a natural number n, there exists a p, so that p is prime, and n is less than or equal to p. All right, so this is tantamount to stating there are infinitely many primes. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, there was a. Uh, uh, someone sent me a message. I'm not sure if it was a question. Uh, anyway, sorry, I'll just continue. Um, uh, okay, so I want to prove that there exists a prime number which is bigger than n, right? And of course, I write p bigger than n in this other way where the inequality goes in the other direction by convention. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I, the reason I want to show you this is just to show you how you can apply one theorem in proving another. Uh, so how's the proof going to go? Well, I know somehow that every even number is the sum of two primes, every even number bigger than two. So I'm going to take the even number uh, two times n plus four and use the fact that that's the sum of two primes. If two n plus four is the sum of two primes, then one of those numbers is prime. Uh, sorry, one of those numbers is bigger than n. So this keyword have will allow me to introduce something else. So before I did this, I just had this natural number n and the thing I want to prove about it. Once I have Goldbach, I now have Goldbach's conjecture as one of my uh, hypotheses. And I know it's true because I use sorry. Um, so Goldbach says something about every even number or every number n such that n is even and it's bigger than two, then there exist two primes adding up to n. Um, uh, all right, so I want to apply Goldbach to 2n plus 4. I need the plus 4 because I need it to be bigger than 2. So to do that, I can just type 2n plus 4, uh, sorry, 2 times n plus 4 as the sort of first parameter of Goldbach. And so now you can see that what I have in my hypothesis is the specialization of Goldbach conjecture to 2n plus 4. So it says that if 2n plus 4 is even and bigger than 2, then it's the sum of two primes. All right, now, sorry is a very useful. I don't want to bother with proving that 2n plus 4 is even or bigger than 2. Those are just obvious facts, and I want to kind of keep going. So I can just type sorry and sorry to fill in those two, those two silly hypotheses that I needed to verify. And now Goldbach's conjecture is telling me 
that there exist prime numbers p and q adding up to 2n plus 4. And like before, I've got an existence statement and I can use this obtain tactic to <clears throat> actually produce the objects that, it, that are claimed to existed, that are claimed to exist. All right, so when I did this, I, I ended up naming all these things that I was introducing. But what I've got is numbers P and Q that are both prime and add up to 2N plus four. All right. Uh, now I've got an existence statement I wanna prove. I don't actually know which of the primes is the right one. Uh, there'd be various ways to approach this, but contradiction is one of them. So suppose that what I wanted to prove was false. What, what happened there? I changed my goal from something to just proving false, proving absurdity. And I now have a new hypothesis, which is the negation of what I wanted to prove, right? So that's just a proof by contradiction. Uh, and I don't like, and then there doesn't exist. It's a bit annoying to handle that. So I can, um, I can just do another nice tactic to simplify the logic there, which is called push neg. So what push neg does is it turns this there doesn't exist statement into a for all statement, this is not the case. So we'll just do the logical gymnastics that you'd, you'd do yourself, but you don't have to you know, apply De Morgan's law or any of that nonsense. You can just get push neg to do that for you. And now I have a more useful version of this hypothesis that for all prime numbers, they are strictly less than n. Of course, that's what I'm assuming for a contradiction. Now I have this statement about all prime numbers that is one of my assumptions. So I can specialize it to the prime numbers P and Q. Like this using have statements, oops. So I made a mistake there and Lean will not be shy about telling me that. But what I've got here is that P is less than N, which is what I get when I specialize this hypothesis to the prime number P. And I can do the same thing for Q. So now I have that P is less than N, Q is less than N. These hypotheses are called this because I didn't bother naming them. I'm not actually gonna need the name. What's important here is that I've basically got my absurdity. I've got that P plus Q is 2N plus four, P is less than N, Q is less than N. So that's just impossible. And I don't have to really think about the details. I can type linearith and linearith will handle this. It's actually doing linear programming under the hood. It will try to find a contradiction to a system of linear inequalities using my hypotheses and it finds one here, of course. And so now the proof is done. Even if you believe Goldbach, I still had to fill in these sorries. And it's actually really quick to do this. And often these sort of really little things you can just prove in very, very concisely. So I can just type in very small proofs of this. This one here, what do I have to prove? I have to prove that two is less than two n plus four. Okay, well, that's just a linear thing. And I can just type linear to do that. Right, so I just filled in those two sorries in, in almost no time and I, I'm at the end of my proof. I still have a warning because I used Goldbach's conjecture and I didn't actually prove that, but this is a, a proof that is infinitely many primes modulo that. It wouldn't be too hard to actually prove there's infinitely many primes properly, but it would take me a bit longer than the time I have here. Uh, okay, so this is what um, <clears throat> uh, using a prover looks like. I, I think there's a really nice, it's almost a kind of video gamey sort of reward thing where you get to the end and you have this blue goals accomplished, which you'll grow to love. I, I think it, it, really, um, it really can be quite compelling and addictive to do this. And it's sort of, it combines mathematical creativity when you're actually doing proper stuff with um, with a kind of craft that you get from from programming, and I, I think it's quite it's quite enjoyable. And I also think it's it's kind of good for the community that we learn this stuff. So if you like this this demo, then just please talk to me. Uh, okay, so this is all happening in a little scratch file, um, and the scratch file is part of uh, a Matroid project. So you can see there's all these lines here. There's about ten thousand lines in total. Um, <clears throat> different sections, they have different lemmas. Um, so I'll show you a few of uh, the theorems that have been proved, but this is, yeah, this is the, the Matroid project that I'm inside here. Uh, I'll start with axioms. So <clears throat> this is the file that defines a Matroid. Uh, and I like the rank axioms. I think there's probably a reasonable 
argument for defining them in terms of the, the rank axioms that makes various things easier. Of course, you can pick your definition of matroids, but here are the rank axioms. Um, I've actually called an axiom R0, which is just the fact that ranks are non-negative. For various reasons, I've made my ranks integers, not natural numbers. Um, so this first axiom, it says that for all x, 0 is less than the rank. <clears throat> the second axiom, the rank is at most size etc etc these should look completely familiar normal mathematical notation with maybe the fact that uh, the, the only difference being I did some modularity in the opposite direction from usual because we use inequalities in that way um, these are all properties these these lemmas these are properties that a function may or may not have so satisfies r0 is a property that is either satisfied or not satisfied by a function from subsets of the ground set to the integers and rank fun, which is essentially a matroid, consists of a function from the ground set that subsets of the ground set to the integers that satisfies these four axioms. So this structure here really is a matroid for various reasons. I actually wait till I call it a matroid till later. So a matroid on a ground set alpha is one of these rank function objects. The other axiom sets, or a few of them, are also in this file. They're not part of the definition, but I relate them to the definition in the ways you'd expect uh, later on. <clears throat> okay, so here is a, um, a larger file. This is the file that contains most of the kind of basic bread and butter lemmas you need to do matroid theory. Um, so there's lots and lots of them. Now, lots of these you would not think of as lemmas. You wouldn't write down lemma this, lemma that if you're writing proofs. But when you're doing stuff in formalizers, you just often need more precise, specific versions of things. And what you can see here, I'm doing things for closure, I'm doing things for spanning, I'm doing things for rank, for circuits, um, for flats, and various other axiom sets are proved in this file, um, at least in one direction. <clears throat> and uh, at the end, there's some stuff which allows you different ways of proving two matroids are equal. So this is saying that if two matroids have the same rank function, they're equal. If they have the same independent sets, they're equal, etc. Just to zoom in on, on one lemma in particular, this is the kind of thing you, you need. Um, it's good to have this as an explicit statement. Uh, where is it? So this says rank equal of less than or equal to union. So this is a lemma that says that if you have two sets X and Y, and the rank of X union Y is at most the rank of X, then they're the same rank. This is obviously true because X is a subset of X union Y. So they don't, <clears throat> if the rank of X union Y is at most the rank of X, they must be equal. Um, this is the kind of explicit statement that it's useful to refer to in other places. Of course, it's got a trivial proof. And you'll notice this proof here, this is the whole proof, isn't written in the form that you, that I was writing proofs when I showed you earlier. This is what's called a term proof. And term proofs are often harder to unpick mentally when you're a mathematician. Um, but they can often be a lot shorter. And it's part of the convention that when the proof is that's obviously true, you just write the shortest proof you can. And so no one is going to be learning the proof of this silly statement by reading this line. So you just need a formal proof of this. And term mode, which is kind of getting into this functional programming side of Lean, um, allows you to do this very concisely, especially this lambda symbol, which has nothing to do with matroid connectivity, is one of the ways that you, you can really make proofs very pretty and concise. Um, there's also kind of underscores where you're asking Lean to fill in things that it can infer from context. And uh, the, the extent to which you can do that is really cool. Okay, so I'll show you some actual results. Um, this is the proof of <clears throat> Edmonds matroid intersection theorem. So this is a real, a real result. Um, the matroid intersection theorem is a theorem about a pair of matroids on the same ground set. Um, it tells you that the maximum size of an, a set that is independent in both matroids at once is the same as the minimum value of the expression rank in the first matroid of a set plus rank in the second matroid of the complement of the set. Um, so here, I mean, I've, I've actually used this Greek letter because you can do that kind of stuff in Lean. Um, 
this Greek letter nu denotes the size of the largest common independent set of M1 and M2. If you want to make sure that really did mean that, you go to the definition of that and read that and you'd be able to convince yourself this is really what you think nu is. The right hand side is saying it's the minimum value of this function. And what Lambda is doing, uh, if you haven't worked with functional programming before, this Lambda is saying it's the function which takes this thing to that thing. So this is the minimum value of the function which takes a set X to the rank in the first matroid of X plus the rank in the second matroid of X complement. Now, um, many of you will have seen the proof of this theorem. You need to do a few things. You, need, you probably need induction. Uh, you, there are different ways to phrase it and it relates to other things and you can kind of prove other things first and derive it or, or vice versa. Um, this is basically a proof from scratch. I don't assume any non-trivial theorems in getting here. <clears throat> uh, and this proof is more, you know, split up and you can see I've written comments that say how it's going. Uh, if you look over on the right, you can kind of follow the mathematics. So at some point I do induction and I, I get a base case and a um, inductive step and then I simplify things. And you can see that the proof state is, is continuing. Um, the base case here is when everything is a loop in one matrix or the other. So the non-base case, you have an element E that's a non-loop in both matroids. And now you take the deletion of E in both matroids and the contraction of E in both matroids, apply induction, and you, you know, you're building up these assumptions. You have these little claims, which are kind of bracketed with have. And it doesn't, I mean, it looks like a computer program, but if you're actually following what's on the right, and if you're the one writing this from scratch, you will follow what's going on. It, it feels like you're doing mathematics and you're proving claims to get to the end. And so you go on and on, you apply induction to various things. And at the end, what happens <clears throat> is that you have a lot of inequalities comparing rank functions of various objects, right? So you, you apply the inductive hypothesis to this and to that, and then you have the thing you're assuming for contradiction and you get a bunch of different inequalities which are mutually contradictory. And here you'll see this magic invocation of Linareth, which will just recognize that those inequalities are mutually contradictory. So the last line of matroid intersection is again, this uh, Linareth. Uh, okay, I'll show you <clears throat> another result. This is really one of my favorite theorems in matroid theory. Um, Kung's theorem says that if you have a matroid that omits a Q plus two point line as a minor, then the number of points in that matroid is at most the size of a projective geometry of the rank of that matroid over a field of size Q. And that kind of even works even if Q isn't the prime power. Um, it's being a bit slow to compile here for some reason, but this, is, this, is, this proof does actually go through lean even if it doesn't look like, like it on the right. Uh, did I do something really silly here? I'm gonna remove this because I don't need this. I don't want my code to look like it's broken. Um, uh, all right, so Kung's theorem, <clears throat> you do it by taking a minor, uh, you contract an element, you apply induction, and you use um, <clears throat> estimates on the number of points in the matroid. You compare that to the number of points in M contract E and the lines of M through E, and you do some sums. It's not, it's not terribly hard to prove, but it's actually something I only managed to prove last week. Um, the reason it took me so long is because it's really hard to get some of the auxiliary definitions that you need to state it and reason about these objects. Um, so the proof of Kung's theorem, as you can see, is quite short comparatively, but it relies on things which took lots of false starts and so on to, to even define correctly. So the matroid intersection theorem and Kung's theorem are definitely the mathematical highlights of this body of code, but I'll show you something else that I was inordinately proud of actually getting, uh, which you'd not, you'd not think is going to be a problem. Um, so that's what I want. <clears throat> uh, that is the following. So this is a theorem which states that if L is a minor of M, is actually is isomorphic to a minor of M, and M is isomorphic to a minor of N, then L is isomorphic to a minor of N. The proof is four lines, and you'd think if you are familiar with the mathematics of the statement, this is about what it deserves, right? This is a triviality, like you, it would take two seconds to prove this. Um, it took me a long time to prove this, and it was because 
it's really hard to define minor and isomorphism correctly in a way that is easy to work with and they interact nicely with each other that makes this statement actually true. Um, and it's difficult for a reason that's kind of hard to articulate if you haven't got into this stuff so much. Um, but I'll make an analogy. <clears throat> Suppose you want to define a complex number and you're doing it really from scratch. So you have to start with the natural numbers via the piano axioms, then you define the integers, then the rational numbers, then the real numbers. You probably have to make a choice with the real numbers, whether a real number should be a Dedekind cut or an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences or something else. But you say what a real number is. And then you say something which is tantamount to saying that a complex number is an ordered pair of real numbers. All right, so that's, that's just what you do and you do that in some form. The problem is if you do that, then the following statement is false. The, the statement that's false is that the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. Now that's a statement that is useful to pretend it's true. I mean, we're basically trained to identify the real numbers with a subset of the complex numbers because it's such a natural thing to do. And fussing about the distinction between a real number and an ordered pair of real numbers where the second thing is zero is the kind of thing a precocious undergrad would do. It's, it's not productive at all. Um, however, you really have to care about stuff in that is kind of in that direction. So lean is based on something called dependent type theory. And saying that the real numbers is a subset of the complex numbers is sort of a meaningless statement in dependent type theory. The meaningful statement is that a re real numbers are canonically equivalent or isomorphic to a subset of the complex numbers. This is what's called an invisible map. And we're trained as mathematicians to ignore these things, but you have to engage with them. So all the stuff I scrolled through is all mathematically basically vacuous. Um, what this is saying, what this limb is saying is something like, um, if I add some punctuation and remove some punctuation, that's an isomorphism. Um, it, it's, it's just all this kind of um, boilerplate stuff and it's, it's an artifact of dependent type theory. I'll, as a disclaimer, the reason this is so long is mostly because I'm not very good at writing code with dependent type theory yet. Um, but you, write, you really run into issues of something that you really want to just be a subset, but it's not quite actually a subset when you want to take a minor of a matroid. Taking minors is really difficult to get right and you always have to sort of trade off this versus that. Um, I haven't got a, a solution that's beautiful yet, but we've got something that's workable, which is why this theorem is only four lines to prove uh, as it should be. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, Rose, do I have five more minutes? Yep, sounds good. Um, all right, so I, I uh, maybe preempting some questions. I, <clears throat> I'm, I feel quite bullish about theorems that are interesting in combinatorics actually being provable. Of course, the cap set problem has already been done, and that's really my, my favorite example of something that's been done in lean. But I would like to prove something that is interesting and contemporary in matroid theory, like an existing theorem um, that is interesting and contemporary in matroid theory. I think doing that by the end of the year <clears throat> would be a realistic goal. Um, two things that you won't see if you looked at my list of features that lean matroids has is graphic matroids or representable matroids. Those things are both, um, they're both hard. I mean, I, I, obviously they need to happen, but uh, they both involve interactions between matroids and other types of mathematical objects. And those kinds of interactions interfaces are where it can be quite hard to get the definitions right. Um, maybe a more short-term goal for me is I'd like to prove that U24 free minors, uh, U24 minor free matroids are the binary matroids. Um, I think that will that will be a, a fair amount of work, but it's obviously a, um, a sensible goal. Uh, but yeah, I think that proving harder theorems is really within reach. Um, as combinatorialists, we're lucky because the statements that we make about mathematical objects, usually the objects are not themselves so complicated. Our statements tend to be simpler, more elementary statements than, um, than people doing algebra or analysis or something like that. And because of that, I think it's, uh, there's more that's actually within reach. I've, I talked to a, an analyst friend of mine who says that there's probably a thousand person years of work before um, formalizing modern analysis research, but I, I don't think that's the case in combinatorics. Um, so I would like to be able to actually prove hard things using, um, using lean. Um, finally, I'll say that 
<clears throat> if you're interested in this stuff, there are a lot of resources. Um, I'll just mention one. If you search for natural numbers game lean, then you'll find something you can do in a web browser where you can basically start from almost nothing and prove things about the natural numbers using the piano axioms. And you'll actually kind of get some sense in how to do things in lean and just play around with it. So it's something you can do in a, an hour or two and it's, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, the online community for lean when you start having more questions and um, having harder problems to solve is very, very welcoming and receptive. Um, I know from personal experience, they won't just answer silly questions, but they will even take seriously um, large bouts of whinging about the language not being exactly the way the way I want it to be. So um, I think that possibly there's one or two people in this in this talk. So thank you for being such a, a good community there. I think that um, it really makes it easier for mathematicians to get into this stuff. Uh, okay, I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you, Peter. <clears throat> um, so are there any questions? Um, I have a question about what you were saying about, um, so you said graphic matroids and representable matroids aren't in there. Um, and I'm sorry if you already said this, but so does it, it this is just be, is like if I wanted to define that or maybe define like other matroids that have as their ground set, like graphs or some other combinatorial object, like how hard would that be? Is that sort of- um, the, the difficulty with graphs is that uh, Graphs actually haven't been done to that large an extent in Lean. Um, most of what's there is about simple graphs. Um, and I mean, I'm not the one doing it. So I, I'm, I'm impressed by the work that's been done. But obviously, for matroids, one needs multigraphs. Um, and multigraphs aren't really done <clears throat> in, in Lean at all. So one of the difficulties of, um, of doing graphic matroids is defining graphs in a way that's good. And that is surprisingly difficult. Graphs somehow present problems that very complicated algebraic objects don't present because if you're doing algebra, then you're very concerned with things like morphisms and maps between things. And that's somehow more sympathetic to the dependent type theory. If you're doing combinatorics, sometimes you really want stuff that feels more set theoretic than type theoretic, and it can be a challenge to get it right. Um, so I think graphic matroids are gonna be harder than representable matroids 100% for sure. Okay. Huh, interesting. And but, but I mean, like, if okay, so I, I have a particular example in mind where you don't need multi graphs um, mm -hmm. uh, that are not graphic features, but they're like supported on graphs. I mean, would would this be that difficult? Just like having a graph that's your ground set, or um... Um, so I think it, it would depend exactly on what you're doing. Um, I think if you're not wanting to like interface your graph with a whole bunch of interesting theorems in a library and graph theory, then it might be doable. Like if it's, if somehow what you can state is not too hard to talk about in the language of matroids, then it, it should be possible. It's certainly possible if you have a, an arbitrary ground set to build a matroid on that ground set by telling me what the independent sets are, something like that. That's, that's doable. I'm happy to talk about this more if, you, if you'd like to talk offline. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> I was wondering um, what theorems you have in mind. You said you were looking at, you were wanting to do some sort of contem contemporary sort of research theorems. Um, so I would like to prove, and I, I mean, I, I, I feel like it sounds very big headed, but I'd like to sort of prove some of my own theorems just because I, I understand the math and it, it reduces some of the things I'd have to worry about. I'd like to prove that almost all matroids are non-representable. I think that's that kind of vaguely fits in with um, what's been done in the cap set problem where you're talking about the interface between polynomials and, and matroids. Um, I'd also like to prove the extension of Kung's theorem with prime powers um, where you improve the bound when, when Q is not a prime power. Um, but it's gonna be hard. You need projective geometries for that. And I, I gave some thought to projective geometries and concluded they were terrifying. So um, we'll see. But yeah, it is, it is stuff in the direction that you might be very interested in. <clears throat> yeah, so I had a question that maybe was answered by your last remark. Uh, did everyone, did anyone ever checked that there's no projective plane of order 10? Uh, I don't know much. Actually, one of the... Um, 
on my i can show you this in a minute what, what on my matroid side actually i'll maybe i'll share it again um Actually, I'll have to I'll have to send you an email to be sure about this. But there there is something I've seen which uh, talks about things like these args theorem, um, and it's people mostly doing stuff with finite geometry. The word matroid shows up in their paper in one place, and it might be in this kind of context. Um, I don't know exactly what has and hasn't been done there. Okay. Yeah, I would be interested in uh, seeing that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Peter, do you have any links you want to share for uh, where people can um, let me let me find, find the, the code or anything like that? Let me find the natural numbers game. Oh, okay, yes, I'll, I'll I'll link you to the GitHub where you can look at all our um, horrendous code. Hmm. Um, okay, so this this is the the natural numbers game. Um, uh, this was this was made by. Um, <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> people at Imperial College London um, Kevin Buzzard is a mathematician that's been a very um, high profile proponent of lean um, and it will it's kind of even phrased like a, a kind of a video game like you have an end boss and you have to prove this and prove that and prove that and it will really teach you things one by one it's really fantastic um, and I'll find sorry where did you post the link uh, the oh the sorry I, it was a direct message sorry I'll do it again um There we go. Okay, so here is the GitHub repository where you can you can read any of our code. Awesome, great. All right, thank you everyone for coming and thank you again, Peter.